welcome you back to Small Group. I do pray that you are experiencing true um, connection, true understanding. I, I pray that your faith is growing and getting stronger. We really do want to have these times together be so refreshing and so encouraging into your heart, your life, your everyday walk with God. And we just pray that it is doing that. So welcome. Thank you for being here. So today we get to unpackage another fantastic chapter three. And this time it is 2 Timothy chapter three. This is a great chapter. And I do pray our goal is for you to get into the word of God. We want our conversations. We want our small groups to be around the word of God. And so uh, if you've not read it, I want to encourage you to read 2 Timothy chapter 3. There are some real fantastic understanding and truth found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to unpack some key lessons that I think are very important for all of us that want to follow God, that want to really let our faith be what it is supposed to be, meaning life-giving, hope-filled, growing, and healthy. And so uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 really gives us some great insight. And uh, I just want to just share a couple of these lessons that we can learn from 2 Timothy chapter 3. The first one is that it begins the chapter saying, hey, you are living in dangerous times. I think the King James Version calls it, Timothy, these are perilous times. These are, uh, you're in an environment where your faith is going to be challenged. And he does not leave this open to your interpretation or mine. He just begins to tell you what kind of environment you are living out your faith. So he'll say things like this. He said, there are going to be people that are lovers of of pleasure more than lovers of God. They are they they love money, they're boastful, they're proud, they're abusive, they're disobedient to their parents, they're ungrateful, they're unholy, without love, they're unforgiving, they're slanderous, they're brutal. They they, they these are people that you are called, these are environment you are called to live out your faith. He wants it to be known up front. This is hostile territory. Again, you, you see this every day. As you try to live for God, you see the pour on of temptation. You feel the pressure of how to be a light in a very dark world. And, and Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, this is the reality. You, when you read this chapter, you are thinking you are watching the news or reading the paper, the 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 paper today. You, you would think you are just reading what is going on in our world right now. And yet this is written really thousands of years ago. But yet it's so true. We are called to live out our faith in hostile territory. Nowhere in scripture, ladies and gentlemen, nowhere in scripture does it ever tell us that living for God is going to be easy. It's going to push you on every side. It's going to push you in every dimension. It's going to make you question everything that you believe. It's going to question your stand. It's going to draw you away. There's going to be so much things that come against you in this. And that's what 2 Timothy chapter 3 begins to tell us. You are living out this. And yet he continues to write, because there's another lesson that in chapter three that he wants you to understand, and it is this, that we can maintain, we can survive, we can thrive, we actually can be victorious. And the way we do that is preserving through sound doctrine. This is where it gets interesting. And this is where you and I, if we really care about truth, and we're a lover of scripture, that we need to understand and need to settle the issue of what we believe. And and he calls it doctrine. There, there is a culture right now that's trying to convince you and I that doctrine doesn't matter. Like, let's just believe in Jesus. Let's love Jesus. And everything is going to work out in the end. We, we don't have to get into the, the nuts and bolts. We don't need to get real down to the specifics because a God is a God of love and he understands and we're trying to all do the right thing. And so we'll just get there in a different way, but we're all heading in the right direction. And yet, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, there are false teachers. There are people that are going to devour truth. They're going to compromise truth. They're going to cause you to question truth. And this is why it's so important for you and I to solidify doctrine, what we believe, why it matters. And so the question I normally ask in these kind of situations is I say, hey, the Bible clearly says there are false teachers. There are lying teachers. And the question I want to ask you is, do you know any of them? Do you know any of them? Or does anybody that professes to be a Christian, anybody that carries a Bible, anybody that just says, I love Jesus, that you're going to believe anything that they say? And yet the only way for us to know what is true and what is false is to know truth. Uh, I remember, uh, again, we had a, a friend that was a bank teller, and they would say something like this when they were training us to be a bank teller. 
um, they didn't put a bunch of counterfeit monies in our hands and, and get us to try to uh, sense what a counterfeit dollar bill or counterfeit $20 bill felt like. They kept on putting real dollars in our hands, real money. Because the more we understood the feeling, the felt sense of real money, it would be easier for us to detect counterfeit money. I never forgot that. I think the more you know truth, the more you will understand what is not true. So when somebody says something or teaches something or believes something or profess something, that is not true. When you know truth, you understand that. And Paul is telling Timothy, the way we endure, the way we persevere is that we know doctrine. And then he says it like this, Timothy, you've known me. You know my life. You know my story. You know what I've taught. And you need to know really who is teaching you. Like if somebody that gets on YouTube or somebody that gets on television or somebody that gets on the internet or Facebook and, and they're just, hey, I'm going to talk about this or whatever, but you don't know them. You don't know their life. You don't know their story. You, you don't know really their foundation and you receive all of that. Uh, the scripture really warns us against that. Know who you're being taught from. Know the individual. You know them that labor among you. Know their life story. Know how they live everyday life. Know, know them. And when you receive and your spirit, somebody says, well, my pastor, you know, they, they live 2,000 miles away and I get fed on Sunday morning through YouTube. And, and uh, again, you don't know them. You don't know the, about their life. There's a danger there. There's a risk there. I'm not saying you can't listen and be encouraged. Again, I, I'm not saying that there's not some good there. But our spiritual development, our, our doctrine, you better get taught by people that you know and that you know that their life and store are in alignment and that they are teaching the word of God and, and, and they are doing their very best to lead you in a spiritual manner. Paul really tells Timothy in this chapter three. The other thing that is so encouraging is that Paul says, listen, I, I've been persecuted. I, I, I've been, uh, uh, men, I've been, you know, really sought after. I've been, uh, had opposition. I've faced some challenges. I've faced hardship, battles. And then he says something like this, and through it all, God has delivered me from every persecution, every opposition. Man, what he's saying there is that, man, you can endure. There's an endurance there. He's not saying that you'll never face uh, struggle. You'll never face opposition. You'll never face times of where your faith is not on a high or your faith is struggling. You're, 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 this is a real faith. It's a reality. It's a real life. He said, but through it all, you can endure. You can survive. You can make, you can, you can, you can get through this. That's the powerful lessons that we learn in this chapter three. But if we took one verse in chapter three of 2 Timothy, if I was to draw our attention, our focus just to one verse and uh, talk about that and glean some insight from that one verse, it would be 2 Timothy chapter three, verse 16. I'm gonna read it to you. And, and, and it reads like this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I'm going to just talk about that one verse in chapter 3, verse 16, where it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. There, there is a confidence you can have in the Bible. There is a, a trust you can have in scripture. I know there are so many people that have tried to disprove the Bible. There are so many people that have invested their life, their intelligence, their resources, their, their energy into trying to find a way to disprove the Word of God. I mean, this has been going on for eons. And yet, uh, again, smart people, intellectual people, brilliant people, educated people have tried to figure out how to undermine the authority of the Word of God. They've spent their life resources. And a lot of them are dead in graves today, and you don't even know them. And yet, the Word of God prevails. Yet, we're, we're it's so current, we're talking about it right now. That The power, the sustainability, the endurance of the Scripture. When you begin to really study the Bible, and, and you really how it was formed and how it came to, buy, came to be, you, you need to settle the issue that the Scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. That's how it came into existence, that God directed writers to pen scripture. That's why it's so enduring. That's why it's the greatest book ever written. That's why it's more, more, more read than anybody. That's why it has more validity and more arche, uh, uh, archaeology and more truth about scripture than any other resource or any other book in human history. 
you can trust the word of God. You anchor our faith to the word of God. That That is the mind of God. It is what God's opinion is the Bible. And so we trust the word of God. We believe that it is eternal, unchanging. We don't believe that we, it, that it is needs iterations and that we improve on God's word. It is forever settled. And when you come to that confidence, when you have settled that issue that I'm going to base my life on scripture, that's our highest authority. I'm going to honor the scripture. It helps you make decisions in every area of your life, every area of your life. Yet you can use the word of God to let it lead and guide you in every area of your life. That's how powerful the word of God is. And so what I love about this verse is that it really does solidify, again, the fact that this is God's spirit moving on people to write the word of God. And you can trust the word of God. You can build your life. If you've not, then I'm going to tell you something. Then you need to base your walk with God on the word of God. I, I will say something like this. Like if you don't have a relationship with the, your Bible, you, you don't really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You, you may love Jesus and you may profess that and you may have a bumper sticker or whatever. But honestly, if you want God's continually thoughts and, and, and encouragement and words of life, then you have to have a relationship with the word of God. But he gives us even deeper insight about this. And when he begins to say this, and the word of God is, is profitable. Again, it's profitable. It's going to help you. It's not damaging. The word of God is not to wreck your life. It's not a killjoy. It's not up to mess up your family and mess up with the way you want to live. It's profitable. It's going to help you. If you obey it, you listen to it, you lean into it, it's profitable. And these are the areas that it's profitable. And he said it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He wants you to know that. These are four areas of our lives that the Word of God really it's profitable for. So let me break that down. He said it's for doctrine. Again, we talked a little bit about doctrine, but doctrine is what we believe. That's what we believe. If you want to know what we believe, the Word of God, we go to the Word of God to teach us what we believe. Okay, I, I appreciate your opinion, and I appreciate other people's. I hope you appreciate my opinion. But at the end of the day, what matters most is not your opinion nor my opinion. is the Word of God. We base our doctrine on the Word of God. We don't base it on tradition. We don't base it on a man. We base it on the Word of God. He said it's also profitable for reproof. Reproof is what not to believe, what not to believe. Like if we have been raised a certain way. For instance, the first church were all raised in Judaism. They, they were not Christians. They, they did not believe in Jesus. They, but because they begin to be discipled and because they begin to learn and because they begin to be transformed by the Spirit of God, they, again, they had to forsake, abandon the way they were raised and say, no, there's a better way. Paul writes a lot about it. That's why you have a lot of the New Testament because there's a lot of people that wanted to go back to what they used to believe. And he's saying, no, the word of God is to reprove you. It's to get to, to tell you what not to believe. And then he says, it's for correction. And this is how not to behave. Again, the word of God teaches us how not to behave, that we, we cannot just live any way. This is why I'm, I really worry about people that say, well, hey, you know, I gave my life to Jesus a long time ago. I can live any way I want and, you know, I, I'll, I'll die saved. Um, man, there's a, there's so many scriptures that warns against us because it's the word of God really teaches us how not to behave. We, we can't do this. Shall you continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, can you live any way you want? And somehow God magically just just forgets all of that and sprinkles grace on you. And, you know, you don't have to honor God's word. No, no, no. It, it teaches us not how to behave. And then it says for instruction in righteousness, this is how to behave, what we should be doing. We should be lights. There, there, there should be something different about our life. Again, if people don't know you're a believer, if people can't tell the difference between a Christian and a sinner, because of their life, their their language, their choices, their the way they, they live. Again, there should be a difference between a Christian and a sinner. There should be. Unfortunately, in our world, that line is becoming so small and so thin. It's scary. Uh, I, some, someone once said, you know, churches are so shallow now that even saint could be a member of a church, right? And again, there's, there's a little truth to that. That no one wants to make a, a commitment. No one wants to make a, a heart call. No, we don't live that way. We live this way. This is what the Bible asks of us if we're followers of Jesus. 
And, and the in the verse 17, the reason I wrote that, because there's a promise here. And the promise is, is this, is that if we do that, if we let the word of God reprove, rebuke, correct, instruct us in righteousness, he said, then we're beginning to come perfect or, or mature. We're, we're going to get, we're going to grow. Our faith is going to get stronger. We're going to get healthier. We're going to get better at this. We're going to mature. And then he says, you're going to be thoroughly furnished, which means equipped. You're going to be mature and you're going to be equipped to do what God's asked you to do. You're going to be mature. You're going to have the, the, the insight, the understanding, and you're also going to have the equipping. You're also going to have what it takes to do the will of God. There are so many great lessons in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, I do hope that your group begins to talk about it and wrestle with it, but this is what I want to share. Uh, ask yourself some questions. How, how has the Word of God reproved you? How has it given you instruction of righteousness? Why does the Bible being God-breathed matter so much? I just pray you have a great discussion. I pray that God blesses you. Thank you so much for being in your small group. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. It's so powerful, so life-giving, so hope-filled. God and Lord, when we align our lives and our choices and our decision, our thinking with your word, our lives are better. And God, when we don't, let your word, let your word lead and guide us, God, to please you. I pray a blessing on every member. God, bless the discussion time in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.